What's going on guys? Sam Adams here and welcome to a brand new episode of Caffeinate. Today for February the 20th of 2019, my name is Samuel Adams and welcome to today's show. Now for those that are brand new to the podcast, of course this is a daily gaming news show where I bring you the hottest gaming news from around the industry and pack it up in one tight neat little podcast for you to enjoy. Now today... We do have some news, finally, about TwitchCon 2019, the more, I suppose you would say, concrete of the two TwitchCons that the company is now offering. But that's a story for another day. Not to dig on TwitchCon Europe, but maybe to dig on TwitchCon Europe. Uh, however, the 2019 show is returning to the San Diego Convention Center with its fifth annual event, which is shocking to say the least because that means time is flying very quickly. Now, on top of that, we have more news about the XEA executive Patrick Soderlund's new project being worked on by a brand new company. On top of that, Steam is getting rid of its video and movie selection, which, to be quite honest with you, I didn't really realize existed. I, I knew that there were movies on Steam, but I thought it was just some kind of rumor going around. Uh, on top of all of this, Overkill's The Walking Dead earned $3.7 million from sales in Q4. The Chinese government has yet again halted approvals to work through the backlog that they have built up over the past few months. We will talk more about that. And finally, the U.S. government has stolen Yoshi's Island music which isn't the only thing they've stolen more than likely, but we'll talk about that specific uh, instance of stealing on today's show. But again, if you are brand new, I do hope you enjoy tonight's program. But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into it with news about TwitchCon 2019 and its return to the San Diego Convention Center. Again, five years deep, that's crazy to me. Twitch's community celebration event, TwitchCon, will be returning to San Diego for its fifth annual celebration this year in September. Twitch fans will descend upon the San Diego Convention Center on September 27th through September the 29th, as TwitchCon invites members of the Twitch livestream community, their fans, moderators, and developers, publishers, and brands to be a part of the show. Previously, the show was held in San Diego in 2016 and has returned once more. TwitchCon panels, partner experiences, exhibitors, programming, and ticket sale information will be coming soon, though Twitch hasn't released this information just yet. It is coming at a later date, along with a way to purchase tickets to the event, but this is just the first round of announcements. There are currently a limited number of reduced-rate hotel rooms near the San Diego Convention Center for interested parties, and they are available on a first-come, first-served basis for those who are interested in attending the Twitch-centric gathering, though passes to the show are not yet up for grabs. Of course, the Twitch-centric convention typically brings tens of thousands of streaming fans together and is expanding this year with the first TwitchCon Europe, which we mentioned briefly at the beginning of the show. The event has been going on since 2011 and invites users to come together to celebrate gaming, esports, anime, music, and art streams. TwitchCon Europe will kick off the festivities this year as it heads to Europe and Berlin, Germany this April, and it is running from the 13th of April to the 14th of April. And of course, tickets for that event are available now. Also, to Spike live in the chat. What's going on, my friend? Uh, so, this is pretty good news overall. Now, I'm not somebody who has ever attended a TwitchCon, and more than likely, I won't be going to this one. Uh, but with that being said, of what I can gather, the San Diego Convention Center and the San Diego area in general is a fan favorite. Again, I've just been kind of scrolling through Twitter, getting the general opinions of a lot of people that have gone before, and they seem to like San Diego a pretty good bit. Uh, now, I don't know exactly what you are looking to get out of your trip to San Diego and your trip to TwitchCon, uh, but if you did want to get a hotel room that is relatively close to the convention center, I would recommend going in as early as humanly possible uh, for you because, quite frankly, as somebody who tried to get into a hotel room to go to TwitchCon last year, uh, it was still very, very packed, uh, even... Uh, early on in comparison to a lot of other people. Now, will you be able to find some kind of hotel room? More than likely. But with that being said, if you do want to get very close to the convention itself, you should go ahead and jump on that again if you can. Now, passes are going to be coming out uh, in the next couple of months, I would assume next couple of weeks, so we will keep our ear to the ground on that one, and I will, of course, let you guys know when those passes do go live. But TwitchCon, in and of itself, is a fantastic event because it really does bring the entire Twitch community together, but on top of that, also takes this incredibly important opportunity to announce a ton of new features coming to Twitch, and of course, my favorite part, the metrics of user base and all of that good stuff, uh, where they're going as a platform 
platform the entire uh, corporatization of it of twitch which again is not necessarily the most po positive skew uh, but it's still very interesting to hear about what it is doing uh, from the company side of things uh, so all of that to the side if you did want to get in on twitchcon 2019 again the show is running september 27th through the 29th in san diego california so if you want to get in on that you can get in on at least the hotel room as of right now but moving on to the next piece of news ex-ea executive patrick soderland shares a glimpse at a brand new project and i must admit it looks pretty interesting. Longtime DICE and EA executive Patrick Soderlund quit EA last summer after nearly 20 years at the company and, also worth mentioning, less than 12 months after being awarded $20 million to stay. Now, he has shared a first look at what he is doing next. At a new studio, Embark, founded three months ago and already staffed by more than 50 people, Soderlund is building an as-yet-untitled free-to-play co-op action game. Early artwork from the project shows figures in futuristic suits exploring an unfamiliar landscape. An early environment test exploring the game's use of Unreal Engine is, of course, embedded below. It sounds like we'll be seeing more of the game sooner rather than later. Quote, we are focused on getting something out there quite fast that we can build upon, Sutherland wrote in a Medium blog post today. A really fun game that, if popular, can expand with design and functionality that take us closer to our long-term vision. Longer term, Sutherland's ambition for Embark is to create games which can then be used to help players make fresh gaming experiences for others, which all sounds a bit like Dreams, the game coming to PlayStation 4 now announced as an early access release in spring of 2019. Beyond getting started with our first game, we have one large overarching ambition, Soderling continued. In essence, we think it's too hard for people that aren't professional game developers to create games, and we want to blur the line between playing and making with games and tools that empower anyone to create. Just like anyone today can produce their own videos, write their own blogs, or make their own music, we imagine a world where everyone is able to create and share meaningful interactive, interactive experiences. Excuse me. Our belief is that the more people that are empowered to create, the better, more interesting, and more diverse games will become. And so, if you did want to check out the gameplay, or at least the uh, engine of Embark, then by all means you can check out the video which I'm playing right now. Uh, and I will be the first to say, this looks absolutely stunning. Now the question is, is this actual gameplay footage, or is this just a rendering? Of course, it is just a rendering. Uh, but to see what this technology is capable of, and what this game platform could very well be capable of, uh, is something that is very revealing of the future. Uh, but I think the most interesting piece of this story is specifically the idea that Sutherland is presenting where anybody can pick up uh, this specific game or any kind of game that has this idea and make literally any kind of experience that they want. And essentially, you hand the keys to the kingdom to everybody to be a game developer, uh, which again is a fantastically interesting idea and also a fantastic idea uh, in the old term of fantastic. It is something that is just uh, borderline impossible possible yet also something that is amazing uh, because of the power of being able to create a genuinely good game and where that could potentially lead you as far as a future goes. Uh, now, as mentioned in the article, Dreams is a game of a similar kind of nature, uh, but I have seen some incredible stuff created within Dreams, which is, of course, made by Media Molecule, the creators of Little Big Planet, uh, and I've seen stuff that goes as deep as to recreate the playable trailer or playable teaser, whatever you want to call it, uh, for Silent Hills, the canceled game that Hideo Kojima was working on before leaving Konami. Uh, but it's stuff like that that proves to me that this kind of technology does have a place, but it does also bring the question in my mind of is there a place for that kind of experience in the industry because in my personal experience and in my personal gameplay style I would rather sit down and play a game that has been created by a game developer as compared to sit down and use these tools to make my own game now again that is just my opinion that's just what I like to spend my time doing but for somebody that approaches game creation in the way that I approach podcast production or video creation, then I could totally see this style of game and this style of program, uh, even I would go so far as to call it, uh, become a very popular entity within the gaming industry. So we'll see what happens here, but I love it whenever somebody who has been an insider in the industry for a very long time kind of takes a step back and begins to approach it with a new set of eyes, a fresh set of eyes, and really tries to, I guess, push the industry forward as compared to just continuing in the never-ending cycle of stuff that EA and DICE and all these other companies tend to pump out. 
But with that being said, no release date, of course, but it does seem to be something that would be coming fairly soon. And as it does say in the quote, uh, probably early access release. But again, we'll see what happens with this one. And I will let you guys know when this does hit via the drop, the weekly series that launches on Sundays over here on the YouTube channel. But I'll tell you what is not going to be launching any kind of videos anytime soon, and that is Steam, because Steam is getting rid of its video and movie section. Valve is taking Steam's movie and video section offline. The company announced the news today with a brief message, and the video tab is no longer available in the store. That was fast. Uh, after a successful run with gaming-related videos, such as documentaries and makings of, Steam decided to get into the business of selling movies, TV shows, and content you don't generally associate with the platform. Devolver Digital's indie film library, for instance, was available on Steam, as were TV shows like Alan Tudyk's Con Man. Okay, now Valve is moving away from this expansion to refocus Steam video on gaming-related content. Quote, in reviewing what Steam users actually watch, it, it, excuse me, it became clear, I was doing a Bugs Bunny thing there, uh, it became clear we should focus our effort on offering content that is either directly related to gaming or is accessory content for games or software sold on Steam, the blog post reads. You can still find existing content using search and videos associated with games will continue to be listed on their store pages and library entries. Additionally, any content you currently own will continue to be available for download. So expect non-gaming videos to slowly get removed from the store in the coming weeks. But I will say I like the approach here because I think there is definitely a space for videos of any kind of style on Steam. Uh, and especially this idea of gaming related documentaries because I feel like there is such a huge potential that a lot of people are not tapping into within the gaming industry for creating video content around development and production and what goes on behind the scenes that we don't necessarily think about whenever we sit down to play a game. Uh, just as a brief example, I would love to see a behind the scenes walkthrough of the development of Apex Legends and how difficult it was to keep that a secret uh, now that it is a worldwide sensation of course in my own humble opinion uh, but I do see a lot of companies do this kind of thing. We have No Clip, which is led by Danny O'Dwyer, uh, that essentially goes around to various production companies within the industry and begins to kind of take notes and really show people what is happening uh, with these companies. Of course, my favorite of their lineup is the Bethesda documentary, uh, an incredibly intriguing look into what goes on behind the scenes at one of the industry's biggest pillars, really, of development and of gaming culture. Uh, but that's all beside the point. If you are a fan of Steam movies, then you better just subscribe to Netflix or Hulu or any of these other services that exist because they are much better in every way, shape, or form. Uh, but again, if you did happen to buy a couple of things, they're still going to be there. Have no fear. Steam is here. Moving on to another game that is available via Steam that arguably didn't do so well. Overkill's The Walking Dead still managed to earn $3.7 million from sales in Q4. That's pretty impressive. Starbreeze earned $3.7 million in revenue from Overkill's The Walking Dead in the fourth quarter, despite the game launching at the start of November. In the three-month period ending on December the 31st, 2018, Starbreeze earned SEK $82.5 million, about $8.9 million in revenue, down 20% over Q4 of 2017. Overkill's The Walking Dead was the most significant, excuse me, significant contributor, a little tongue twister there, uh, to that total, but its net sales following its launch on November 6th only amounted to about 34.1 uh, million SEK, or about 3.7 million. By contrast, Payday generated SEK 20.4 million, or 2.2 million, despite Payday 2 having been released in 2013. Again, a game released in 2013 generated 2.2 million as compared to the brand new flagship game, which generated 3.7 million in the same time period. That is telling of the quality and of the adoption rate of Overkill's The Walking Dead. Now, with that being said, Starbreeze's pre-tax loss for the quarter was about $135 million, far bigger than the uh, $7.3 million loss in the same quarter last year. The commercial failure of Overkill's The Walking Dead was cited as a key factor in Starbreeze narrowly avoiding collapse in early December. Just days later, the Swedish Economy Crime Authority raided the company's Stockholm headquarters, seized computers, and arrested an unnamed person. 
Four of the seven members that comprised the Starbreeze board stepped down in Q4, and so it was left to acting CEO Michael Nurmark to offer comment on the company's investors. The fourth quarter was a turbulent period for Starbreeze, with the parent company Starbreeze AB and a number of subsidiaries going into reconstruction. After having served as CEO for just over two months, I remain optimistic that we will come through this period in a good way and emerge stronger from the transformation. I feel confident about the strategic route we've taken. Going forward, we will focus on the core business, game development and publishing. Across the entire year, Starbreeze earned $37.6 million in revenue, down 3% over 2017. Pre-tax losses amounted to $145 million, a huge increase over the prior year's $176.3 million loss or at least million SEK launch, whatever that is in dollars. Uh, since the close of the accounting period, Starbreeze signed a deal with Universal for the mobile title, paid a crime war, and it also sold the publishing rights for System Shock 3 back to other side entertainment. It originally invested $12 million into System Shock 3 in March of 2017, so again, uh, they took a hit on that one. Uh, but it seems like Starbreeze is beginning to regain its foothold, or at least its footing in general, because, of course, Overkill's The Walking Dead was anticipated to be a huge release uh, for the end of 2018, but as it did you know, kind of come time for the game to come out, it didn't pan out well. Uh, of course, the game itself looked acceptable. It wasn't mind-blowingly gorgeous, but it also wasn't abysmal either. Uh, however, the gameplay was very hollow. The gameplay was something that just wasn't engaging for a lot of people. And now, with that being said, they did try and create a viral marketing campaign or a creator content creation campaign, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they tried to get into that online atmosphere, and it just didn't take. Of course, they put the seed down, but sometimes it just doesn't grow. Uh, so, to see it make even $3.7 million uh, is something that is shocking to me. I thought it would be much less than that. Uh, but even more so, I'm shocked to see the company doing this well, even as we talk about such an incredible loss, but still uh, seeming to be on the mend. So, again, best of luck to the guys at Starbreeze. I feel like anybody can redeem themselves in today's day and age, especially within the gaming industry. Just because you have one bad game doesn't necessarily mean that your company is a bad company. It just happened to be a bad deal, and in general, not a great game from Overkill. So, if you did want to play the game, I wouldn't recommend it, uh, but it's probably on sale at some point in the next couple of weeks. So, uh, again, avoid it at all costs, but if you are curious as to what earned 30 or $3.7 million. I was about to multiply that by 10. That would have been much better. Uh, then by all means, you can dive into it. Now let's talk more about this Chinese government situation because it has been something we have had on the plate for quite some time. Chinese government halts new game approvals to work through the backlog which is kind of counterproductive, but again, we'll put that to the side. Barely two months since the thaw, China's State Administration of Press and Publications has once again frozen new game approvals. That's according to an anonymous gaming executive close to the issue who confirmed the news to South China Morning Post. The information has yet to be made public, and there is currently no indication when the latest suspension will be lifted, but companies can still submit games for approval to the queue. However, Nyko Partners analyst Daniel Ahmed said this move was almost inevitable given the backlog which built up during the nine-month freeze last year. Again, for those that don't know what we're talking about, games in China have to be approved before they are put up for sale, and so they have to be individually examined, individually tested, and individually approved on that style of, of, uh, of approval system. And so, with a nine-month freeze... I mean, if you can imagine what it's like whenever TSA shuts down in the airport, well, that's pretty much what you've got, a giant queue of games waiting to be approved, many of which are probably very well into making some money. They're trying to really get into that Chinese uh, ecosystem, uh, and so it has been quite the hindrance for a lot of people across the board. Again, Apex 2020 is what Spike says in the chat. Again, if you do want to see these games come to China, that is exactly what we are going to have to actually go through, is go through this approval system, and that is going to take a very long time. So long, in fact, that Apex, as an example, might actually die down before the game is even available in China. Uh, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, so even so, a prolonged suspension could hurt publisher earnings, as noted by Nyko Partners founder Lisa Hansen when speaking with the South China Morning Post. The suspension last year proved painful for the Chinese games industry as growth slowed to single digits for the first time in a decade. Literally, they are throwing a, a giant branch in the spokes of the bike of the gaming industry. It could be blowing up right now, but again, 
China, man. Uh, so after reaching lifetime peak sales in January last year, Tencent lost roughly 33.7% of its value, while NetEase saw a 31.6% wipe over the course of 2018. Companies tanking, not tanking, but losing a significant amount of their market share because of this change. Furthermore, despite bringing both Fortnite and Player Unknown's Battlegrounds to China, the freeze has left Tencent unable to monetize either game. You can't make money on Fortnite or PUBG in China. That is absolutely nuts. I didn't know that, but that is changing the game in my mind. Um, wow. You know, that is a lot of money being lost out on that. It's a significant amount of... Oh, my gosh. I mean, think about that. Uh, with that being said, though... I understand why they're still keeping these games available, because if you are able to grow your market share and if you're able to get a player base established in that region, when you are able to monetize this, then you are really going to be able to take advantage of it in the biggest and most profitable way you can. Again, though, this stings. This is bad. Uh, so as they do work through this backlog, I encourage anybody that has any kind of pull, which again, if you're watching this show, why? Wow, thank you. This is great. Uh, but if you do have any kind of pull in this situation, by all means, please speed up the situation. Figure out some way to split up the team and allow the back-end approvals, the backlog to be approved. And on top of that, uh, start accepting new games just so we can work through this faster. There has got to be some better way to do this. Uh, but, again, bad situation over there for those that are, I don't know, in favor of number one playing games and in favor of number two making money. I'm a fan of both. I, I like both. But, let's move on to the final story of the day. The U.S. government has stolen Yoshi's Island music for a Flash game about recycling. This is the kind of stuff that I do the podcast on a daily basis for. The United States Environmental Protection Agency has an educational Flash game on its site called Recycle City Challenge. That, in and of itself, is not special. However, what is interesting is that when you click the Let's Get Started button, a familiar tune for Mario fans play. Keen-eared listeners have noted that the song in the background is taken from Yoshi's Island DS. The song no longer plays in the Flash game, having probably been removed, but we have heard it with our own ears, they say at Game Informer, and there was no mistaking it was, in fact, this tune. I can't play it because I don't want that to be taken down for me, uh, but The Verge has reached out to the EPA for comment after the incident, and this is their statement. The Recycle City Challenge game was created for the EPA by a contractor. We are looking into whether the contractor received permission to use the music to the extent permission was necessary in this instance. And of course, for more on this weird intersection of governments and video games, you can find more about tons of past experiences with the gaming industry. Uh, and very few of them are good. Uh, there, is, there is very little interaction that is positive between the government and the gaming industry. Uh, but... With that being said, uh, insane to see that they have uh, contracted out a Flash game that was then developed and Yoshi's Island music was used on it. Now, with that being said, good taste from the developer. Yoshi's Island music is solid. It's very relaxing. It's a good, good, little, uh, good little diddle, if you will. Uh, but again, very illegal. Very, very much so against any, any kind of legality there. Uh, so, if you did want... To follow up on this story, I would encourage you to go over to Game Informer, find more information about this, and of course, we'll figure out what happens, and I will update you guys if the story is relevant on a future episode of Caffeinate. But indeed, I am trying to avoid demonetization, so we are not going to be playing that tune. But I would encourage you, all of you, to go listen to it. Really good tunes there. But with that being said, that wraps it up for today's episode of Caffeinate. If you did enjoy this one, be sure to drop me a like down below if you are watching on YouTube. And of course, if you are hanging out live in the chat, I appreciate you very much. And the show is hosted right here on twitch.tv slash the Samuel Adams five nights a week, Monday through Friday, around 7 p.m. Eastern time, where you, yes, you, can keep up to date with all of the hottest gaming news from around the industry, from the U.S. government to... TwitchCon 2019. Uh, but until tomorrow, I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the night. I will talk to you soon. And peace.